Well, let's look at verse 20 of Habakkuk chapter 2. But the Lord is in His holy temple, let all the earth keep silence before Him. I would say most of us in this audience are probably familiar with that verse. But what does it mean? It doesn't really have anything to, to do with our being quiet in the assembly. I'm for that, but uh, don't think that's the idea. If you look at the context of Habakkuk, Habakkuk looks around and what he sees is injustice, uh, cruelty, things that just ought not to be in society. And he says, and I'm paraphrasing here, why, why don't you do something, Lord? Look at all this evil. Look at all what's going on. Why don't you do something? The Lord's reply is, I am. I'm raising up the Chaldeans, the Babylonians, and I'm going to use them to chasten my people. Well, Habakkuk thinks about that, and he says, wait a minute, is that fair? Look at verse um, 12, I'm sorry, chapter 1, verse 13. He says, you are purer eyes than to behold evil, and cannot look on wickedness? Why do you look on those who deal treacherously and hold your tongue when the wicked devours a person more righteous than he? Are you going to use them to punish us? Well, they're worse than we are. How is that fair? Well, then Habakkuk knows he's over, overstepped his bounds. Look at chapter 2, verse 1. He says, I will stand my watch and set myself on the rampart and watch to see what he will say to me and what I will answer when I am corrected. And then God does answer him. When I've used the Babylonians to punish uh, my people Judah, then I'll punish them. I'll bring them down. And so Habakkuk's reply is, the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth keep silence before him. If I understand the passage, what he's saying is don't talk back to God. Whatever God says, whatever God does, don't talk back to God. It's right. The Lord is in His holy temple. Let all the earth keep silence before Him. I heard of a woman one time who was trying to teach her children to be quiet in the assembly, and instead of going shh, which made noise, she just put her finger up to her mouth which says, be silent. We need to learn to just put our finger up to our mouths when God acts. Let's name several occasions of that, of that nature. First of all, when God speaks, let all the earth keep silence before Him. Turn to Matthew chapter 17. Start with verse 1 of Matthew chapter 17. Now after six days Jesus took Peter, James, and John, his brother, led them up on a high mountain by themselves, and he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, and his clothes became white as the light. And behold, Moses and Elijah appeared to them, talking with him. Then Peter answered and said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here, if you wish let us take, make here three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and suddenly a voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear Him. Can you imagine those three apostles shaking their fist and saying, We'll listen to whom we want to. Oh no, God had spoken. And they're silent before him. In fact, look at the very next verse. And when the disciples heard it, they fell on their faces and were greatly afraid. God had spoken. And God has spoken a lot on a lot of different subjects that we need to be concerned about. Turn to the 19th chapter of Acts. I'm sorry, Matthew. Matthew chapter 19. Look at verse 3. The Pharisees also came to him, testing him and saying to him, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for just any reason? 
And he answered and said to them, Have you not read that he who made them at the beginning made them male and female, and said, For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother, and shall be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh? So then they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore what God has joined together, let not man separate. Two things here that God speaks concerning. First of all, what marriage is. He made them male and female. That's what marriage is in God's eyes. But give me a one word answer to the question, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for just any reason? What's the answer? No. Now, after further questioning, look at verse 9. And I say to you, whoever divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another commits adultery. And whoever marries her who is divorced commits adultery. Somebody says, that's not fair. Surely God wants me to be happy. But all the earth keeps silence before Him. God has spoken concerning what a person needs to do to be saved. Turn to Mark chapter 16. Look at verse 15 of Mark 16. And He said to them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. Somebody said, now wait a minute, I read a tract and it said I didn't have to be baptized, that if I just pray a prayer. That all the earth keeps silence before Him. God has spoken what we should do on the first day of the week. Turn to Acts chapter 20. Look at verse 7. Now on the first day of the week when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul, ready to depart the next day, spoke to them and continued his message unto midnight. Somebody said, but if we break bread every first day of the week, it's going to become commonplace. God has spoken. And when God speaks, let all the earth keep silence before Him. Turn with me to James chapter 1. I want to start with verse 18. James chapter 1 verse 18. Of His own will He brought us forth by the word of truth, that we might be a kind of first fruits of His creatures. So then, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath, well, the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Now, that may be a good advice in any situation. Be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. But the context here is of when the Word of God is being discussed, and when the Word of God is being discussed, then let all the earth keep silence before Him. Be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. When God acts, let all the earth keep silence before Him. Turn to the book of Leviticus. I want to go to chapter 10. Leviticus 10 beginning with verse 1. God is acting. Then Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, each took his censer and put fire in it, put incense on it, and offered profane fire before the Lord which He had not commanded them. So fire went out from the Lord and devoured them, and they died before the Lord. And Moses said to Aaron, This is what the Lord spoke, saying, By those who come near me I must be regarded as holy, and before all the people I must be glorified. So Aaron held his peace. You may have a translation that says, Aaron remained silent. God had acted. I wonder what I would have done in, those, in that situation. Would I have said, this is not fair. Fire is fire. What difference does it make? One fire can burn just as good as another. God had acted. And Aaron had to hold his peace. He had to remain silent. And that's not all. 
There were two men assigned with the task of taking the bodies of Nadab and Abihu out. Look at verse 6. And Moses said to Aaron and to Eleazar and Ithamar his sons, Do not uncover your heads, nor tear your clothes, lest you die. And wrath come upon all the people. But let your, your brethren, the whole house of Israel, bewail the burning which the Lord has kindled. You shall not go out from the door of the tabernacle of meeting, lest you die. For the anointing oil of the Lord is upon you. And they did according to the word of the Lord. They were not even allowed to mourn. In the usual kind of a way, God had acted. You know the story of Nadab and Abihu ought to be a leave a strong impression on us. God does not allow us to do those things for which we have no authority. He does not allow us to substitute our ways for His ways. He won't allow that, and we see that so clearly here. And if we wonder about the action, let all the earth keep silence. That was Habakkuk's problem. God was acting. He was raising up the Chaldeans as a means by which he would punish his people. And Habakkuk couldn't see it, but let Habakkuk be silent. Turn to Matthew chapter 7. I'm looking at verses 21 through 23 of Matthew chapter 7. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me. You practice lawlessness. That may seem unfair to us. Here are people who have given their lives thinking that they were serving the Lord. They've done mighty things in the Lord's name. And the Lord turned them away. Let all the earth keep silence when God acts. When troubles and difficulties come into our life, let all the earth keep silence before Him. I want to take you to three passages of people who had just learned really bad news. And I want you to see their spirit. Turn to 1 Samuel chapter 3. God had never spoken to Samuel. But in the night, you well remember, Samuel heard a voice. Samuel, he went running in daylight. I didn't call you. Again the voice, Samuel, again he goes to Eli. The third time, Samuel, and this time, Eli realizes the Lord is talking to the boy. Go back and lie down, and if you hear the voice again, say, Speak, Lord. Your servant hears. Now, most of us know that, but do you remember what was told to Samuel that day? Look at verse 15. Well, let's start in verse 11. Then the Lord said to Samuel, Behold, I will do something in Israel at which both ears of everyone who hears it will tingle. In that day I will perform against Eli all that I have spoken concerning his house from beginning to end. For I have told him that I will judge his house forever for the iniquity which he knows, because his sons made themselves vile, and he did not restrain them. And therefore I have sworn to the house of Eli that the iniquity of Eli's house shall not be atoned for by sacrifice or offering forever. I suppose you'd heard that message. And you're going to have to tell Eli that God's going to bring an end to his house. Look at verse 15. So Samuel lay down until morning and opened the doors of the house of the Lord, and Samuel was afraid to tell Eli the vision. Then Eli called Samuel and said, Samuel, my son. He answered, Here I am. And he said, What is the word that the Lord spoke to you? Please do not hide it from me. God do so to you and more also, if you hide anything from me of all the things that he said to you. 
Then Samuel told him everything and hid nothing from him. And here was Eli's reply. It is the Lord. Let him do what seems good to him. Eli had his faults. That is one of the great statements of the Bible. You have just been told that the Lord is going to bring an end to your house. It's all over. And your reply is, it is the Lord. Let him do what seems good to him. Keeping silence before him. Now to 2 Samuel chapter 15. On this occasion, David is having to flee from Absalom. The conspiracy is strong. Many are going with Absalom. And here comes Zadok the priest with the ark of the Lord. Look at verse 25 of 2 Samuel 15. Then the king said to Zadok, carry the ark of God back into the city. If I find favor in, his, in the eyes of the Lord, he will bring me back and show me both it and his dwelling place. But if he says thus, I have no delight in you, here I am. Let him do to me as seems good to him. That's almost the same thing that Eli said. Absolute submission to God. Now to Job chapter 1. Job has lost all of his possessions. Word has come that his children are dead. What's Job's reaction? Look at verse 20 of Job chapter 1. Then Job arose, tore his robe, and shaved his head. And he fell to the ground and worshiped, and he said... Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked shall I return there. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And all this Job did not sin, nor charge God with wrong. What are these three men doing? Eli, David, Job. They are keeping silence before the Lord. Whatever comes into their life, they are totally submitted to the Lord. And let Him do what seems good to Him. But I think every one of us knows that all people don't react that way. Troubles come into people's lives and they are filled with bitterness, hate, blame God, turn away from God. I remember a young man came in and just lost his job and he said, I have served the Lord all these years and what has God ever done for me? The answer is, he gave his son to die for you. That's what he's done for you. Do we rebel against God? Let all the earth keep silence before him. Whatever may come into our life. And good men can do that. Look at Psalm 73. In the Psalm 73, we read of a man named Asaph. I don't know whether that's what you call him in Texas or not, but that's what we call him in Alabama. Asaph. And, and he's a good man. Look at verse 1, beginning of Psalm 73. Truly God is good to Israel, to such as are pure in heart. But as for me, my feet had almost stumbled. My steps had nearly slipped. For I was envious of the boastful when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. For there are no pangs in their death, but their strength is firm. They are not in trouble as other men, nor are they plagued like other men. Therefore pride serves as their necklace. The violence covers them like a garment. Their eyes bulge with abundance. They have more than heart could wish. Look at these wicked people and how God is blessing them. I... Look at verse 13. Surely I have cleansed my heart in vain and washed my hands in innocence. For all day long I've been plagued and chastened every morning. How is it? How is it fair that all these wicked people are prospering out here and here I have served the Lord and it's all in vain? Look at verse 16. 
When I thought how to understand this, it was too painful for me until I went into the sanctuary of God. Then I understood their end. Surely you set them in slippery places. You cast them down to destruction. Oh, how they're brought to desolation as in a moment. They're utterly consumed with terrors. Asaph finally caught a hold of himself and realized, no, I'm the one blessed. We recently had a man move over from Louisiana to Alabama to worship with us. His uh, daughter worshiped with us and they needed to get closer and he has Alzheimer's and rapidly declining, but he brought something to Hartzell that many of us has taken up. Every time you ask him, how are you? He says, blessed and highly favored. It doesn't matter who you are, you're blessed and highly favored. Yes, I've lost a son. Yes, I lost my wife a little over a year ago. Yes, my sister died back in March. I'm blessed and highly favored. God has been so good to me. And he's been good to every one of us. Yes, we've gone through difficulties. All of us have gone through difficulties, haven't we? Is there anybody here of any age at all who hasn't gone through troubles and trials and difficulties? Let all the earth keep silence before him. God is so good. It's one of my favorite songs. Asaph was not by himself. Job raised some of those questions. Do you remember that? The people of Israel in Malachi's day raised some of those questions. So I guess we ought not to be surprised if today some people raise the question of why the righteous suffer while the wicked are so richly blessed, it appears. But just, well, I'm reminded of the two farmers who live next to each other. One of them never worked on the Lord's day. He always worshiped God. The other one didn't care about the Lord. He worked on the Lord's day, didn't go to worship, and his crops turned out better than the Christian's crops. And he chided the Christian. See, you went to worship. You didn't worship on the Lord, didn't work on the Lord's day. And look how much better my crops are than yours. And the Christian answered, yes, but the Lord doesn't always settle up in October. <laughs> Thank you. I, 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 I tell that a lot of times people don't get it. <laughs> It's not always at harvest time when it comes to the gathering of crops. That's the ultimate blessing. The ultimate blessing is when the Lord says, well done. Let all the earth keep silence before him. All right, let's talk about one more. When God commands, let all the earth keep silence before him. You're probably running ahead of me. Turn to Genesis 22. This obviously is the um, occasion when God had Abraham to offer his only son. Begin with verse 1. Now it came to pass after these things that God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, Here I am. Then he said, Take now your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah, and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. So Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey, and took two of his young men with him, Isaac his son. He split the wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place of which God had told him. Somebody's told me that there was a television movie made of this incident and that when God told Abraham to offer his son that he shook his fist and said, no, well there's not any indication of that. He rose early in the morning to do what God told him to do. He was silent before him. He just, that's what God said to do, and he would do it. Let's us ask the question. Abraham, where are you going? I'm going to Moriah. 
What are you going to do there? I'm going to offer my son. Abraham, isn't this the son of promise? Hasn't God promised that through your seed all nations of the earth will be blessed flowing from this son? And that he would multiply your seed as the stars of the heaven and sand of the seashore and give you this... How's, how are you, Abraham, how are you, he's going, how's he going to do that if you're going to put this son to death? I don't know. And that's the truth. He didn't know. Now, Hebrews 11 says that he thought he would raise him from the dead. Such a thing had never occurred before. As far as we know, I don't know. It, didn't, it wasn't Abraham's business to know. It was Abraham's business to do what God said to do. And when God commands, let all the earth keep silence before him. Just do what God said. But one thing about it, Abraham knew God would take care of it. Look at verse 5. And Abraham said to his young men, stay here with the donkey. The lad and I will go yonder and worship, and we will come back. Who's going to go worship? I and the lad. Who's going to come back? I and the lad. God will take care of it. He'll just do what God tells him to do. It doesn't matter what God commands. Regular attendance and worship. Liberal giving. Forgiving. Praying for your enemy instead of retaliating. Keeping yourself pure from the world. How many things could we name? Whatever God commands. Don't talk back to God. Just do it. And do you remember 1 John 5? I think it's verse 4. Let's look it up. 1 John chapter 5. Verse 3, for this is the love of God that we keep His commandments, and His commandments are not burdensome. Do the commands of God seem a bit burdensome to you? They're not burdensome. Not when obeyed out of a heart of love. Isn't that what this is about? Not burdensome when you think about what Christ has done for you. Have you ever heard somebody say, you have done so much for me, anything you would ever ask for me of me, I will be glad to do it. I couldn't do enough for you. Look what Christ has done for us. His commandments are not burdensome when you think of the blessings that go with obeying those commands. His commands are not burdensome when you think of the punishment that's going to come if we don't obey. His commandments are not burdensome. And I'm just going to make a, a statement that I think is true. What is today? The 18th of November? If, um, if God were to say, now tomorrow doesn't count. The 19th of November is, in 2018 will not count in the judgment. You can go out and do anything you want to. You know what you'd do tomorrow? You'd get up, serve the Lord, pray, read the Bible, uh, Conduct yourself in a good moral. Why? Well, that's our life. Who ever thinks about that being burdensome? That's our life. And we love that life. His commandments aren't burdensome. Whenever God commands. Let all the earth keep silence before Him. It's a sermon in which we simply bow in humble submission to God. Trust Him. Know that everything He says, everything He does is right. And we never question Him. That's the message of Habakkuk 2.20. The Lord is in His holy temple. Let all the earth keep silence before Him. Maybe I'm talking to somebody out here who needs to obey the gospel. You can put your trust totally in the Lord. I know from the outside looking in, it may be that that looks like kind of a hard life. Let me, let me assure you, 
The Christian is the happy person. The one who gives himself fully to the Lord is the person who finds happiness in the Lord. And you live in hope and assurance and confidence and you need to be a Christian. I've heard certain men preach and when I come away I say, well there's one thing that I see in his message. The best thing that ever happened to me was to become a Christian and I want you to too. I might not have been overly impressed with the sermon overall, but if he leaves that message, that is a pretty wonderful message. The best thing that ever happened to me was to become a Christian and have God's forgiveness, and I want you to have it. Why don't you come and obey the gospel? But as you come, make up your mind that you're not going to argue with the Lord. Whatever you learn that He wants you to do, you're going to do it. And that's the spirit with which you come. And you're among friends who care about you and will encourage you and help you. So, in your interest, we stand and sing a song of invitation.